In this video, we'll talk about the spinocerebellar ataxia. Spinocerebellar ataxia or SCA is a group of genetic disorders that primarily affect the cerebellum and to a lesser extent the spinal cord. In this condition, there is a progressive degeneration of the cerebellum. Now, cerebellum controls the movement, coordination, balance, etc. So obviously, anybody can understand there is a problem regarding the balance and motor coordination. Also, there is death of the cerebellar neurons due to specific reason. In this video, we'll try to review the key points regarding cerebellar ataxia and then expand on them. So cerebellar ataxia or spinocerebellar ataxia involves progressive degeneration of the cerebellum. The progressive word is important. Then the symptoms include impaired coordination, especially the motor gait, balance issues, tremors, pitch difficulties, etc. Then diagnosis involves genetic testing, clinical ev evaluation, sometimes MRI and imaging. The management focuses on the symptoms and they can try to relieve the symptom and manage their life with supportive cares like physical therapy to improve the quality of life. Then genetic counseling is required to analyze the risk for the further generation and ongoing research is exploring the potential therapy, especially the genetic therapies. So let's begin and try to break it down step by step. Clinical presentation of spinocerebellar ataxia includes the problem with motor coordination because the cerebellum is degenerating, the neurons are dying, it would eventually lead to ataxia because cerebellum is the portion of the brain that controls coordination and balance. Now in this case, unsteady gait, slurry speech, clumsiness, difficulties with fine motor skills, let's say maneuvering something with hand or painting or this kind of fine-tuning aspect of motor coordination is abrogated. Also, there is involuntary eye movement known as nystagmus. Other features include basically gait instability, limb incoordination, dysarthria, heart-related problems, tremor, ocular abnormalities, dysphagia, that means speech difficulties overall. And there are other aspects which are non-motor manifestations which lead to overall cognitive declinement, the uh, psychiatric symptoms and sometimes peripheral neuropathy. But for every patient, the symptoms are not same. Also, the extent of defects are also not same. This is something to understand. Then let's talk about the genetic aspects of spir uh, spinocerebellar ataxia. So the genetics of Spinocerebellar ataxia is interesting because there are several genes which are involved in this disease. And these gene mutations are categorized as SCA1, SCA2, up till SCA37 and many more. So let's say which genes are mutated. One of the genes that is highly mutated is ataxin 1 or ATXN1. And there is one kind of mutation that happens. There is multi multiplication of these CAJ repeats. In a moment it would be clear why this is detrimental. But anyway, other than ataxin genes, there are other genes like CCNA1, PPP2R2B, DAB1, etc. All of these regulates aspects of nerve, nerve system physiology. Let's talk about the prevalence of this genetic mutation in a global landscape. So different kind of mutations are prevalent in different parts of the world. And this is sourced from an article which is provided in the description as well. Now question is where are these mutations located on the gene? Are they present in the coding exons, introns, UTRs, where? It turns out it's pretty much dispersed in different locations of the gene. There are many mutations which are present in the coding exon. Obviously it would abrogate with the protein production. There are also mutations in the UTRs. That means it can also alter the gene expression regulation. Now let's talk about the pathology of spinocerebellar ataxia in a bit more details. So obviously, we know the sequence CAG eventually codes for glutamine. In spinocerebellar ataxia, there are multiple CAG repeats. But why is that bad? Now, in spinocerebellar ataxia, there are multiple glutamine uh, in basically in repeats. So that is why it is known as poly. Q disease. By, but why poly Q is toxic for the cells? So there are many aspects. Everything is not clear, but some aspects 
are revealed by extensive research. So this is a normal protein and this is a protein with poly Q repeats. In this case, there are specific uh, binding partners which might uh, bind with these poly Q regions and eventually lead to its aggregation. Also, it can alter the bioenergetics overall. It can lead to ion channel dysfunctions. It can lead to RNA binding protein uh, binding to a specific location. Nuclear inclusions are a new concept that can lead to a problem in gene expression as well. So overall, there could be a toxicity in RNA metabolism. There is transcriptional dysregulation and DNA damage which are associated as well. But as I mentioned earlier, all these symptoms doesn't happen altogether. Some aspects of it is true for some different individuals. Now, channelopathies are pretty common in spinocerebellar ataxia. Voltage-gated sodium and potassium channel, calcium-dependent uh, potassium channels, glutamate receptors, and voltage-gated calcium channels are abrogated or their functionality is abrogated in this disease. When it comes to diagnosis of spinocerebellar ataxia, MRI is one of the key screening thing to do at first because there is a cerebellar degeneration, right? Here you can see the cerebellum and in the spinocerebellar ataxia patient, you can see the dramatic change in the cerebellar architecture. Alongside these clinical imaging data, there should be gait examination and other neurological examinations, family history taking, and most importantly, the genetic testing, because it would give you a quick idea that, okay, which particular gene is actually mutated, what type of mutation it is. So high throughput sequencing is the next uh, future for diagnosis of several diseases, including spinocerebellar ataxia. Now let's talk about the treatment options for spinocerebellar ataxia. Managing the symptoms is and giving supportive care is the key management. There is no cure for this disease, but supportive treatment can improvise lifestyle. This includes physical therapy, speech therapy, genetic counseling, and supportive medication that can give you overall cognitive boost. So I hope this was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram for free notes. You can support our channel using super thanks. You can pay via Paytm, PayPal or UPI. See you in next video.